honored and you are loved as our beloved community. Welcome to uh, First Baptist Waysboro, and I'm mean, so excited, Katie and Jean. A lot of you who have not been in the presence of us physically in worship, it's so good to have you, and I'd like to offer you this moment to give a big wave, stand up and give a big wave to everybody and say, welcome to this place, we're so glad that you're here. Yay. As a couple of announcements, uh, I have in front of me here uh, a list of children's sermons that Janice, thank you for putting those together. And if you're named, if you've been doing children's sermons, I have the, the list in the order all the way through October. Thank you very much. For those of you to gather that right after the, the worship service. Also, there's a dinner invitation inside the, the chronicle. And we're going to be having our next congregational dinner uh, the week of the 15th. And I want you to sign up. And we're going to be, just like last month, we're going to be delivering some, drive through some, and we're going to be uh, having in house dinner as well. And that will also be the night of the business meeting. So I'm really glad to kind of be back live. I don't know what. What do you think? Do I? Uh, this is all. It's just all. What's that? That's, you better just go over to this. Yes. Yes. Here we go. Can you hear me now? You know, this sound system group that we've been meeting with. <laughs> this, is, no, this is a great sermon illustration for for the new sound system project that we're working on. Uh, I know Jimmy, back there you're hoping that a puff of smoke would happen, and, and certainly. But if what I want to do uh, as an announcement this morning also is to remind you that we have a couple of meetings today. One is uh, Constitution bylaw right after, bylaws right after, I said bylaw, didn't I? <laughs> That's right. And the second thing is that we're going to be having a children's meeting. This is a children's ministry meeting at 5 o'clock. This is a follow-up to the meeting we had a couple of weeks ago. And for those who received uh, notice about that, if you're interested in sewing into the children's ministry, we're meeting at 5. Uh, and we're just so thankful for the turnout we had for the first one as we invest in the future of the next generation of our of our church and our congregation developing that. The, um, the moment that we realized that as Pastor Lee was praying this morning with the choir, that moment when we realized on Sunday morning that there is a force that really does not want us to gather. <laughs> there, there, why is it, and I've preached about it before, why is it that when we're preparing for worship and to come into worship, that we seem to have the most aggravating moments. Things, we can't find the shoes, uh, our children's legs turn to rubber, and they don't want to put their, their clothes on. Husbands and wives are going, I love you, will you just get in the car? Uh, and I'm not sure, except that there's, in my years of ministry, that there's a, there's a force that just doesn't want us to gather. There always seems to be something opposing the gathering of God's body, which is called the church, the body of Christ. And so part of that conversation in public right now again is COVID again. COVID. And all we're going to ask and say at this moment is just, we're not going to mandate again that you wear masks. But if it is something that makes you feel safer and you want to wear a mask and you want to be part of the loving kindness to others because that makes you feel like that's going to help or it makes you feel personally more safe, please do so. Please do so. I don't have, uh, we, we're staying on top of different emerging views and all, but um, at, this, at this time I'm just saying do that which is loving in your own heart. And, and as my sermon will say later, to, to love others as you love yourself. And let that be your guide. 
At this time, let's focus our, our lives and hearts on Jesus who has brought us to this place for worship. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for getting us out of our beds and allowing us to, to come to this place where we can gather together in your precious name. And Lord, we, we ask that you would give us the, the hedge of protection around us that as we declare your name, that we continue to do so in boldness, that we continue to do so in an acknowledgement that, that the principalities and powers of this world oppose you. But in like kindness, Lord, we are, are gathered in your name where you said you are among us, where two or three are gathered in your name. You are among us. And so, Lord, at this time, let us worship with abandon. Let us magnify the power of your Holy Spirit in our lives that we might be a, truly a beacon on the hill and not just a building. And we thank you and we praise you in the strong name of Jesus.
What's that book we use in the church a lot, you know, to help guide us and direct us? You don't know the name of that book. Sometimes it's big, sometimes it's little. You know him? By... What's the second part of it? Can you say Bible? It's the Bible. There we go. Good looking class. <laughs> um, you know how many books are in the, the Bible? There's 66 books, little books, big books, and some letters out there. And what I find interesting about that, you know, the word Bible comes from, I don't sound like not Bible comes from a great word, Bibles. Which means books. So it's comprised of 66 small books, big books, and letters. Well, I want to focus on their letters. And these are the letters written by Paul. Now, who was Paul? He was a gentleman who went around place to place and would start churches. And he'd go someplace like Corinth. And he'd write a letter. He'd start a church and he'd leave and say, well, but he'd write a letter back to Corinth. And we call that the Corinthian letter. So we have the book of Corinthians, right? And then, um, let's see, where else did he go? Uh, uh, Philippi, yes. He went to Philippi and started a church, and then he came back, he left, went to another place, and wrote a letter back to Philippi. We call that the Philippians. Another place he went was to Colossians. And set up a church. Am I that boring, Ray Ray? <laughs> set up a church in Colossia and left. And he sent a letter back from himself and Timothy saying, I certainly hope all is going well at your church now that you've set up and you're, you're going and everything's going nicely. And every time we see something about you, we think about you and we pray for you. Have you ever had somebody say, I'm praying for you? Now, Ray and all these little things, you know we all pray for you all, all the time. And that makes you feel good, doesn't it? When, some, when you're walking around and let's say you've been sick, you've been in the hospital, and people say, well, we're praying for you. That makes you feel better because you know they're praying for you. Um, I know lots of people pray for me when I was so sick. And I am eternally grateful because here I stay, here I am right now. I'm still here. And for that, I will always feel good thinking about that. I still have a card that the church made for me in my, in my house. And that's been over three years ago. And speaking of letters, how many of y'all have received letters in the mail? Now, when you get older, you'll learn to appreciate when you get a, an envelope that's short and maybe be yellow or pink or blue and not straight and white because the straight and white ones mean bills. <laughs> so if you get a straight and white one, mm, don't get too excited about it. But short white ones or short yellow ones, short blue ones that have your name on it, ooh, it's going to be something good in there. And it got me to think. You know, there are lots of people, sort of like yourself, that haven't received a lot of mail. And so what I'd like for you to do today is, I've got something here I want you to do. I have some envelopes, and I have some stamps. And I'm going to give each one of you a stamped envelope. Make sure I put them in the right place. Because what I'm going to ask you to do and what I'm going to ask all of y'all to do is to, with your mommy's help, three daddies or whomever, go home and write a letter to somebody. Somebody that would love to see that they got a letter from you in the mail. And they will, and you know, said, your mommy's and daddies and everybody will help you figure it out. And you, I want y'all to go there and write it because it's going to be so special. They, they never get much in the mail sometimes. 
So just think how good it's going to make them feel, just as the people in Colossia and Corinth and Philippi did when Paul wrote back to them. So let me do three more. Thank you. Oh, you're home. I don't know. I'm going. I'm hurting.
Over the last few weeks, we've been uh, focusing in on Matthew's version of the Disciples' Prayer. Most of us, we call it the Lord's Prayer, but it's the Disciples' Prayer when Jesus was teaching the disciples how to pray because they saw the power of Jesus' life being lived out this way with his, his power to heal and strengthen and teach, to cast out demons and to fulfill God's purposes and his will in his life because they saw a relationship between God and Abba. And as we saw last week and several weeks at a time, that when he was teaching them to pray, he essentially broke that prayer into two sections. And we've dealt with the two sections kind of to, to part. And just if you're visiting with us, you want to catch up. I'm not going to go back and preach four sermons. But to give you the bottom line, Jesus wanted them to know Abba. The Aramaic word that he used to talk about his relationship with Dad, Abba. And in that conversation, we talked about hallowed and uh, his name is reverenced and, and respected and all those, when he said, your name is to be hallowed. And we, we talked about how in that relationship, Jesus, who is the creator of the universe, through all things have come in our life. Everything that has come into being, everything that lives, breathes, and has its being has come through Jesus. The Gospel of John begins with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the creator of the universe, as we've, as we've studied and looked at this, this magnificent prayer text, the creator of the universe says in his prayer, he's teaching his disciples, Lord, Father, Dad, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as we've looked at the last couple of weeks, the declaring of the world not being lived out in the perfect will of God is evident. Read the paper. Watch the news. <laughs> Come to church. <laughs> this past week, I, I learned a valuable lesson. How many of you know what LinkedIn is? Some of you? <laughs> well, LinkedIn is, is, a, is a platform like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. It's a platform that is used primarily by people to put their uh, professional profiles on that, on that platform, LinkedIn. Uh, for the purpose of creating and sustaining a, a work network. You never know where your next job's coming from and that kind of thing. So over the years, I've kept an active LinkedIn profile. And, and so just to show you how the brokenness of the world is. So uh, this LinkedIn profile has been, I've kept it, and it's grown over the years, and I've kept relationships from Presbyterian College and old, old, uh, uh, churches, uh, former churches, I call them old churches, but former former churches, and, and from the law school, and from Wingate, and Lifespan, and all that. So most of you here know, and if you're visiting, you wouldn't know, but I retired from the secular world of work and responded to the call to come here full time. It's you, right? So I was having a moment this week having some fun with some folks and I decided to change my LinkedIn profile. This is how the world works. So I put on, on my tag up there and it, it, it'll show um, what is your job title? And I put, hmm, ambassador of the message. Right? I'm an ambassador for the message, for the word, for the gospel. And so I just put it out there as ambassador for the message. And then, not knowing how the, and not really having paid attention how it links uh, your job title and where you are at the current time in the same field. How many of you have ever heard me refer to myself on several occasions as the pastor of disaster? 
You, you know the history. So there's a history with that title. You know the, you know the history. But on LinkedIn, it put Pastor of Disaster, First Baptist Church of Waitsboro. <laughs> Oops. And so I got a number of contacts from the years with no questions. Congrats on your new role. <laughs> But I thought about that, and uh, <laughs> this afternoon I have to change it. But this, <laughs> but I've thought about that in the context of the sermon this morning. We actually do know that the world in which we live is broken, and if the Creator of the universe has said, "Abba, we desire, we hope, we want to work for the, Your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven." That means there, there's a brokenness. And I don't think we would come to church regularly. I don't think we would gather together regularly if there was not a bank proposition involved in recognition that there are things in our lives, no matter where we are in our station or our financial state or our health state, that we would not come to church if there weren't times in our lives that we recognized that there's a brokenness. There are things over which we have very little or no control. And Jesus himself is saying, disciple, son, daughter, brother, sister, recognize that there's Abba who loves you, who cares for you, who created you, and recognizes that your human condition is not being lived out in the perfect will of the Father. Now most people receive that as a guilt thing. Well, wait a minute, I'm, I, I, does that mean I'm, I'm living out of God's will? And then that's, that's what we talked about last week, God's perfect will and God's permissive will. That we feel we live in a fallen and broken, broken world. And sometimes the wounds that we have have come to us from, from the past and we end up bleeding on other people and passing it forward. Jesus is looking into your life and my life this morning and saying, you know, you might be a son or daughter of disaster, but there's good news. There's good news for you. This morning, as, as we continue with this notion of God's will in our lives, this sense of praying, God, what is it that you want me to learn, know, understand, do in my life? Who is it that you want me to be married to? Who is it that you, where do you want me to go to school? Where do you want me to work? How do you want me to retire? How do you want me to use my time fruitfully and usefully for your kingdom? God, how can we, how can we, can? and we just keep pouring out the questions. When maybe, just maybe, as Jesus is teaching his disciples, God is saying, Slow down, slow your roll, sister. Slow down, son. Just slow your roll and listen a moment. Learn to listen. We're full of questions. But here's the, here's the thing about the teaching that Jesus is giving to you and to me about learning how to do God's will and living into God's will is that it begins as we talked about last week, with a sense of surrender and recognition that He is God and we're not. That He has purpose and power and understanding that we don't about even the certain, certain situations in which we live. When God can see the whole picture when we can only see a piece of the puzzle. And so it requires a certain surrender in our lives. And that's where we ended last week, where we saw Jesus again in this moment in the garden when he was facing the cross for you and for me and for all humanity to bear upon himself all of the brokenness, all of the disaster that any pastor could imagine. In taking it upon himself, listen to his words. Lord, let this thing pass from me. 
Let this thing pass from me. Nobody wants to go to the hospital. Nobody wants to live in cancer. Nobody loves divorce. Nobody loves living in pain, question, doubt. No one in, in that. A good friend of mine who's uh, in, the, uh, in the Marines, and he did two tours in Afghanistan, he said, sometimes you've just got to embrace the suck. Only a certain generation will get that. Embracing the brokenness. And that's what Jesus did by saying, nevertheless, Lord, your will be done. Not mine. Nevertheless, your will be done. So this morning, the first step into freedom, the first step in understanding, the first step of preparation for having God to live powerfully through you and me and through this church and this community is a notion that God is God and God has the answers to supply and the power. He has the resources of a thousand cattle on the hills. We don't have to worry about that as the money. What we have to understand is that we are a surrendered people to him so that his will, his spirit can live through us. How many times have you talked to somebody about your problem instead of talking to dad about your problem? How often and how easy is it for us to go seeking advice? We're a very, we're a self-help community. We're a self-help society. And we have gotten very articulate about how to talk about our problems, but we have not gone very far into who do we carry those problems to on a regular basis. We're still stuck in self-help. We're still su stuck in trying to solve our problems ourselves. We're still stuck in trying to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps as we talked about a few weeks ago. The physics of that is unimaginable. But anyway, the, how do we get out of these things? And Jesus is, is, is saying, I'm telling you, I recognize this fallen world. And the first step is going to be, in your life, is going to be the first step that he took for his freedom and deliverance, and that's surrender to God. And trusting God as an answer, a purpose, strength. We still act as if we own everything. Even the outcomes of our problems. How many times have you, I've done it as a, as a pastor of disaster, hundreds of times, Lord, I'm going to pray for this person. I'm going to pray for this situation. I'm going to pray for this church. I've had people come in. They want me to fix their child. My daughter, my son's rebellious. And they just, my husband, my wife, my spouse, they're, and you need to pray for it. And they need, and I'm thinking, I've done that. Lord, you must not see the same situation I see. So let me tell you four excellent solutions that you should apply to this situation. Because obviously, God, you, you're not as smart or as insightful as I am about this particular son or daughter or husband or wife or spouse. And so I need to tell you exactly how to fix it. Isn't that just another way of still remaining in control? Trying to determine the outcome. Instead of saying, God, I lay this person that I love, I care about, I lay this situation on the altar for you. One of the hard lessons that I've learned in, in life and ministry over the years is that most of the answers to the prayers that I see come in God changing something in me first and not the other person. Why is that child so rebellious? Why is it? Well, have you looked at your temper, Harry? Why is that son, that daughter, why is that husband, that wife, that spouse, why, why are they, well, you know, are they looking at you as a witness for how you live out your life? And that's why Jesus is saying the first step in this whole following God's will thing is that surrender to him and acknowledging who he is and 
how he loves you and how he has given his own life and surrendered to God. Let me ask you something. If you lost $20 this morning, how hard would you look for it? Jeremy? Real hard. Real hard. If you lost $50, Mark Lady, how hard would you look for it? I put the pizza on that. If you lost $100, Natalie, how hard would you look for it? If you lost a child, how hard would you look? Till you found them. You see, seeking first the kingdom of God is revealing in our hearts where our true love is. And warning with passion what God wants, praying from God's point of view. Lord, you see the son, this daughter, the child, the spouse. You died for them. You love them more than I could ever imagine. And I'm, I'm trusting God that you will do in their lives what is best for them, even if it's telling me to hush. Jesus would, would teach again many, many times, but he would come back to this in Matthew 22, 22nd chapter of Matthew, when he is, he's being questioned and he's being, have you ever, <laughs> Carla, when, I, when she and I married, she had, she, I had a grand, I had, I had a stepdog, and her name was Lucy, and she was a miniature pincher. And she was named Lucy, really, for Lucifer. Is that right? Just, uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> but Lucille Ball, she kept getting into trouble, but I kind of thought it was the other way. But anyway, the, uh, but she was always into stuff, just, just always. And she did not like this new person who had come into her life. And, and she was, as a miniature pitcher, had this terrier personality. How many of you have ever met a person with a terrier personality? Just won't be, just won't let it go. Won't. If, if, I, if I tell you once, I'm going to keep telling you because obviously you don't hear what I'm saying because you're not moving at the speed of which I really want you to move to pick up that trash. And if you don't pick up that trash, if you notice that the trash is picking up, I need you to pick up that. Well, there were Pharisees and Sadducees who act like a pack of terriers and they're coming after Jesus in the 22nd chapter of Matthew about have you thought about the resurrection? Why are you talking about the resurrection? Resurrection really doesn't happen. Resurrected people don't walk around. We haven't seen anybody that's resurrected. And what if somebody is resurrected? How does that not work and if you're married? Are you married to this person? You're married to that person. Suppose we have somebody who's been married seven times. What are, who are they going to be married to in heaven? And, and have you thought about how, how should we pay taxes? I don't know. Is it against the law? Should we pay taxes? Does Caesar care? I think Caesar cares. But is that against the law for the Pharisees? And, for the temple. Should we do both? Should we do neither? Can you <laughs> imagine Jesus going, really? And then they come to the, the critical moment and they said, Jesus, 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 which is the greatest, which, which is the greatest commandment? And I think back to the prayer. Where he had divided his prayer life into two sections. It's all about dad. And it's all about you. It's an old book, but I highly recommend it. It's worth a reread if you've never read it. Rick Warren's book, Purpose Driven Life. Highly recommend it. Rick Warren was a founding pastor of Saddleback Community Church, one of the, the first community churches. But in it, he talks about our 
Christ follower, someone who is submitting to wanting God's will operative in his or her life, sees himself or herself as third. God first, others, and then me. And I think it's pretty clear when we look around the vast landscape of our community that very few people like being third. Whether you're talking mass politics or waiting in line at Bible, nobody wants their agenda trampled upon, or certainly not to be third in line for consideration. But Jesus says to their question, which is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your passion, your intelligence, your strength. Seek God first. Oh, and by the way, love your neighbor as yourself. And upon these, think of a pig, and upon these, the whole law and the prophets hang. You want to know what God's will is for your life? You just heard it from the creator of the universe. Have your life shaped by him first. Seek his kingdom first. Before you go seeking your spouse, before you go seeking your job, before you go seeking rescue in your business, seek him first. And then love these people around you as you love yourself. And this is why I close on this. <laughs> I am so tired of so many people in the, the church, universal, trying to distill the Christian walk to a simple set of do's and don'ts. Well, I followed the Ten Commandments. I hadn't murdered anybody. I hadn't stolen anything. I haven't coveted. I hadn't committed adultery. But what about that first one? There are no other gods before me. We put a lot of things before God. Habits. Things that we consider worth our time more our investments more. Loving each other is an active, wonderful experience of what God is doing for you and me already. And there's more said in the scripture about treating each other with justice, treating each other well, much more about how we handle our money and its hold on us than it does about alcohol or sex or dancing or having your hair move on. As I close, I would ask that we just simply pray together for a moment. And during that prayer, let God do God's work. Lee, you would just... Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we confess, which means we agree. We agree with the creator of the universe that we have not followed your ways, that we have not been obedient, that we have not sought you first above and, and, and first in all things. We confess that we are often more concerned about our own image or our, our own brokenness. But this moment, Lord, help us to open our hands to you and trust you with every portion of our lives. Not just personally, but as families, as communities, as church. 
Lord, let us not rage against each other, but recognize that the principalities and powers of this world who oppose you are the real enemy. And so we ask, Father, that you, you begin to answer our prayers by first helping us to see that we need you, that we're separated from you. cry on us as the Father did in the Gospel. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Maybe there's a place right now where we just can't get over the hump of our own past, or we can't get over the hump of our own name, or our own image, or our own reputation. But Father, you are the one who has declared that we are clean, forgiven. Father and the Son of the